first audience is, how does someone communicate an odor? I don't think that's proper English. So anyway, I changed it to disgusting odors. Disgusting odors, that sounds good. Uh, with diverse audiences. And I think Ray earlier saw me out in the hall and said, I see you're talking about odors. You're, a, you're, not, an, you're not an air quality guy. And I'm not. I'm a really a manure treatment, handling, and systems management kind of guy. But what happened, how I got involved in this, is about the mid to late 90s, we had a large hog expansion in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we went from being like 40th in the country in hogs to 8th in the country within about two years. And odors was a big issue. Uh, the Oklahoma Park Council uh, contracted with OSU to develop a model, a dispersion model, and a. at the time we were... We are about 30 years ahead of the time. We were going to build this process-based model, and we were going to show how odors trap. But, it, yeah, it didn't work. We ended up with a really nice dispersion model, though. Uh, we have a, a, a uh, they call it the mesonet, a small, it's a, it's a large scale, but small mes meteorological station, so we, we can do some real good things with meteorology. But anyway, uh, Jack Tonarogo, some of y'all know him. He's at Virginia, Virginia Tech now. He was uh, at... He was kind of a postdoc at OSU when we were doing this. And we were sitting down one day, and we were saying, how can I, I'm the extension guy, how can I go out in the state and talk about your, your model when we don't even know how to talk about odors? Because most of the time when people talk about odors, they go straight, organic chemistry, over everybody's head. And, yeah, they make a face, and half your audience falls asleep. So we came up with an idea. I, I was thinking along these lines of, hey, we've been selling perfume for a long time, right? They've got to have a way to talk about how they sell this perfume versus that perfume. And it should so happen that, um, I think it was 1997, when the ASABE was meeting in Minneapolis, St. Crow, or St. Crow Instrument Company was giving a presentation on how to measure odors. And they, they use that same analogy, the perfume analogy. So a couple of switches clicked. And so we went down the road, and we've developed this, you're going to see in a second, uh, an a visualization scheme of how we can describe odors using colors and shapes. And the first victims of this method, uh, our animal science have a capstone course, capstone course, and I would, they asked me to come in and lecture on any topic related to engineering, and I said, hey, I want to talk about odors. So I, about four years, we worked with uh, animal science, Students, they seem to be pretty happy with it. Uh, then we had a, uh, we developed a course in ag engineering on experimental methods. And so I have done sensory type analysis with, I think, over 280 college freshmen now. So we've got a pretty good database building up on how they respond to some of the experimental methods. Uh, we've also used it in, out in the state with producers. I've talked to Poultry producers, I've talked to hog producers uh, toward the end. We can talk about some of the reaction. Most of it positive, some not so positive. Uh, you tell a chicken farmer his manure is like perfume. S sometimes they don't. Some, some analogies go over some people's heads. But anyway, uh, so we've, we've used this with a lot of groups, and we'll see if it works with y'all. And you can see on here we have a program. What I'm going to do and this is partially to keep me from going on and on and on, so we get out of here by 5.30. What we're going to do, the first half of this, we're going to kind of talk about the visualization scheme and go through what odors are and how we describe them and how we end up using the visualization scheme. And then we're going to do a little experiment. What I've done, particularly with the BAE 10.12 class, the, the, the experiment, experimentation class, is we've been doing developing different in-class experiments, or you can also do with with more diverse audiences. We've been developing experiments to explain some of these odor phenomena. We're going to do one here. And there's, this is pretty small crowd, so we'll get through it pretty quick. Then y'all are going to take a break. I'm going to be back there calculating the results. We're actually going to look at results of what y'all did today. And we're going to compare the exact same experiment that y'all are doing today with what a group of students did two weeks ago and see how y'all compare and actually, we, we can look at it a couple of years back. And then we'll go through another experiment that we've done that I've actually I've been doing since about 
2000 or so, 1999, 2000. So we've got a lot of experience on that second experiment. Now, you'll notice on here it says part two, three, four, five, whatever. We have everything I'm going to talk about today is up on the web. Okay, we've actually got these as annotated PowerPoints. I call them podcasts, but I don't have the audio. And as it's turning out, probably we may never do the audio. But anyway, you can go to the e-extension web page, which has got this incredibly long address. Or you can go to my personal web page, which is printed on the bottom of your page. If you go to that, it's what it looks like. We have a three or four different websites at OSU that have, that, that have waste management in the title. But this is going to be BAE Waste Manage, and it's the Waste Management Engineering web page. You go to that, you see podcast on the bottom, you click on that, and pretty much everything we talk about today, you're, you can see these exact same slides with notes. So you can, you can download these straight off the web and use these yourself. They're not copyrighted. You know, we want them out there. Uh, there is a part seven that you're actually going to see. I don't actually have available on the web. It may be on the, uh, the air quality site, though. That's some of the results. We hope to publish them someday, so uh, we're not putting them out. Okay, now what I'm going to do now is I'm pretty much going to go through the kind of spiel I give to a producer-type organization. When I do talk to the students, we start off with the science. We talk about the anatomy and the physiology of smell. And if you all want to see that, we can go through that too when you're going through the experiment. Okay? If, you don't, if you've had enough of me, that's, that's fine. We'll speed through it quickly. Now, first thing is odors aren't so mysterious. They are mysterious, but they don't need to be because they have a structure and we can measure them. All right? Your first question is, how can something we can't see and touch have structure? You know, that, that's a kind of a stupid word. But that's exactly what the perfume people say. Odors have structures. And they've been selling perfume for about 3,000 years. Way back to Egyptian time, they were selling, and they had, had to have some way of uh, quantifying what this thing smelled like. How long have we had uh, gas chromatographs? When did they come out? Oh, this is audience participation, by the way. When did gas chromatographs come out? 1900 sometime, probably turn of the century. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, when I was taking organic chemistry in 1980, they were talking about this new thing called a GC mass spec. And now Abby has the major mass spec on NCIS. So we haven't been doing instrumentation. We had not even had organic chemistry that long, yet we've been talking about them for nearly 3,000 years. What the perfume people do, they use GC mass spec now. But for hundreds of years before, they had people that were trained to sniff these fragrances, and they would divide a particular fragrance into what they call the notes, the different perceptive parts of the odor. So a trained sniffer might sniff a uh, fragrance called Rose de Grasse, and I don't speak French, so pardon me. He would say it's characterized by a honey note resembling, resembling very slightly a delicate peppery note. What the heck is he talking about? When I say it has a honey note, what does that, tell you? What does that say to y'all? Smells sweet, but not only sweet, it smells like honey, which is a particular kind of sweet, right? And then it has a peppery note. Pepper, in other words, it has a little kick to it. You know, it has a little bite in it. Shading off to a light tonality of natural carnation. What is carnation? It's flower, but it's a particular type of flower. I, you know, I can't describe, but I can say it smells like carnation. When, when the guy has the lapel and you smell his lapel, it smells like carnation. It, possibly, it is possible to receive a slightly green odor. Now, what's a green odor? Come on, speak it out. Moldy? Grassy? Actually, it probably is a little of both, but it's generally the plant-like smells. The grass would be a good, good example of a green odor. So, fragrances are mixtures of notes. That's the first thing to know. And notes 
are mixtures of older runts. And I, I some of y'all know John Sweeten. I could tell you the John Sweeten story about older runts, but we'll, we'll try to keep this to two hours. If you knew John Sweet, you'd know that it would take more than two hours. Anyway, notes are made up of odorants, and an odorant is a, uh, is a chemical. So if we did put that one green note on major mass spec, we would find all of these chemicals and probably more. And this is where most people trying to talk about odors go wrong, is that they go straight to the, if it wasn't for that darn terpeniol, you wouldn't have any problem with your odors, right? And, you know, most people, college students and or farmers, that's not the way to talk about it. So, Arogo and I were thinking about, first we got to came up with, we had to come up with a good name. We couldn't just say manure smell, because there's other things. We couldn't just say livestock smell. That, I mean, that connotes bad things. We came up with this thing, farmstead. That sounds that's nice, nice Anglo-Saxon word, farmstead. So farmstead odors can also be thought of as mixtures of notes. There's distinct smells within the farmstead odor. And notes are, notes are still groups of odorants. And odorants are still individual chemicals. And as it turns out, there's the five biggies. And usually when I'm talking to the freshmen, they start ne nervously right. I said, forget that. We're, we're just putting that up. You don't even have to remember what the chemicals are. We're, the scheme that I'm about to introduce will get around all of that. Okay. Odors have structure. Odorants, notes, fragrances. They're also measurable. You can basically describe any type of smell asking four, four questions. What does it smell like? I mean, I, you, I guess you already described it. it. Smells like a carnation. It smells like honey. Okay? That's a measurement of the character of an odor. Okay? How long does it last is the persistence. Some smells can hang around for a long time. Some smells only last for a little bit. Okay? How many or how much odorants are in the air is the concentration. Okay, it's just basically the volume of odorants out there, or the, the mass concentration. But really, what we really perceive is not concentration. We perceive a thing called intensity. How strong is it? You can tell me how strong it is, what it smells like, and how long it lasts. You pretty much can describe almost any odor uh, that there is. Okay, we're going to fill up this little chart. We are going to look at the different ways we measure character, persistence, concentration, intensity for both notes and odors. Remember, odors are mixtures of notes. So we actually measure them quite different. Character of the notes is usually exactly like the perfumers do. We say that it has a honey, a peppery. We just basically say what it smells like. Beyond, it smells like pig food. But we break it down into something more concrete. So, getting back to the bad five. What we decided was, instead of going back and talking about methanol, formaldehyde, acetone, whatever, we're going to give a color to each one of these notes, each one of these groups of odorants. And we're going to give them, we're going to say it's a note to the group. And I can tell I've already got some perplexed faces. So we already talked about the green notes. And if you remember, a lot of the green notes had alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, esters. Those are the green notes. A lot of farmstead odors, hay, horse manure, have a lot of green notes to it. They have a lot of planty smells. Okay? Then we go look at the organic acids. Uh, when we were starting the project for the, for the pork producers, there was a lot of research that said, you know, hog odor depends on five fatty acids. And they could rattle off what they were, but who cares, right? Acetic acid, what is acetic acid? Y'all are educated people. What's acetic acid? Vinegar, what does vinegar smell like? It smells like vinegar, okay? Uh, propionic acid, I have never smelled a butanoic acid. Anybody ever smelled butanoic acid? Sounds like feet, yeah. 
It actually comes from rancid butter. That's where butanol comes from. So they isolate that from rancid butter. Capriotic acid, what's Capricorn? It's the goat. Goat smell is actually a fatty acid. So we call the fatty acids, which give kind of the goaty, hoggy type odors, just call them the black nasties and be done with it. Okay, so you've got your greens, you've got your black nasties. Nitrogen compounds, what's ammonia smell like? It smells like ammonia, ammonia cleanser. Uh, smelling salts are usually strong smells of ammonia, strong salts of ammonia. Some of the amines are kind of fishy, fishy smelling. So we give nitrogen the blue note, fish, water, blue. It's also, what is scatol? Anybody ever heard of scatol? Anybody know what scat is? No, that's not skunk smell. Scat is another word for your grandma must, may have used it. Actually, uh, wildlife biologists use it all the time. They go through the woods looking for scat. It's another name for excrement. And lo and behold, all excrement has a certain odor, it has a certain blue note, and that's caused by scatol. Almost what, if we identify it as a fecal scent, it's probably got scatol in it. There's another nitrogen compound, putrescine. What does putrescine smell like? That is the smell o' death, I call it. Okay, but that's usually not a farm's dead odor, unless you've got uh, dead hog composting or something like that. So the blue notes are nitrogen. Phenolic compounds, they're kind of hard to describe, but they're kind of earthy smelling. Uh, so we give them a brown note. Uh, there's, a, there's some disinfectants that use a phenol compound. And you go into a, you go into a my old kindergarten had a kind of a dirty smell. But it was actually the disinfectant they used. And it was a aromatic alcohol, like a phenol. So they're the browns. And then sulfur, what is hydrogen sulfide? Everybody knows hydrogen sulfide. That's rotten egg smell. Somebody said skunk, it's not scatol, it's methylmercaptan, sometimes called methylthiol. Okay, it's the same thing. Uh, methylmercaptan is also the compound they add to natural gas so you can smell it. And one time in Oklahoma City, well, it's the big tornado we had back in 99, there was a plant, we have a lot of natural gas in Oklahoma, so there was a plant in the east side of town that had a, uh, that had a barrel of methylmercaptan to add to natural gas. And the tornado picked up this barrel, and people were smelling natural gas all the way to Tulsa. But it was, just takes a little bit of this stuff. These are usually really smelly. The larger organic sulfides are your garbagey type smells, your rotten garbage. Let's just call them the screaming reds. Okay, so our farmstead odors, the notes are the black nasties, the plants, the blue notes, the earthy smells, and our screaming reds. That's all we need to talk about. Hopefully, I'll get through the rest of this without mentioning another, well, I'll take it back. I know I'm going to say ammonia in a little bit. We can go through this whole thing without talking about chemicals is what I'm trying to say. Okay, persistence. We... Uh, you may have gathered by now that perfumers like to use a lot of musical terms. They use notes and whatnot. They also talk about a chord. In other words, good perfume isn't just one smell. It's a mixture of many smells. Okay. And they break it down into three notes, three levels. The top note, which are the really volatile smells that don't last very long. The middle notes, which are they sometimes call them the filler, the ones that give the perfume the real volume. They fill up the smell. And then the bass note. Sometimes it's spelled like the musical B-A-S-S, -S, bass. It's the, it's the very persistent compounds. Okay? A cheap perfume, if you go to Walmart or a discount store and you buy something that's named after a Disney can Channel character, it's probably all top note. Very volatile, very strong. But you come back two hours later... It's gone. You don't smell anything. You got to keep putting it on. Okay. Your expensive perfumes are going to have all of these, uh, a good cord of different smells. You start out, you put it on in the evening, you smell one way. Toward the end of the evening, you smell a different way, because your your 
through time, you're losing the volatility of these different compounds. Farmstead odors are also like a perfume. We have base notes, which are your black nasties, your earthy smells, your scat type smells, and your garbagey smells. They are the very persistent odor in, in most farm odors. Uh, what we did is we took the chemical rubber company and just looked at the volatility, and we said, here's the continuum from the most volatile to the least volatile, and kind of cut it down into different categories. Is how we came up with this ski. The middle notes are your green smells, your fishy smells, and your skunky smells. Okay, what can y'all notice about what's happening with them shape with those shapes? The base notes are solid. Are solid. The the middle notes are now big ring or, or thick rings, right? So we got get kind of not only the character, but we can also display the the volatility or the persistence with the shape. We only have two top notes to speak of in farmstead odors, and they're ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. Okay, these are the only the the only of the the, the major odorant groups that are gases under normal uh, temperatures and pressures. So, if I was a poultry farmer and I spread my perfume across the landscape, if I went out and I spread some litter, if if I an unsuspecting hiker or whatever, walk down on the field, what am I going to smell? Anybody very familiar? Well, you're very familiar with poultry. What's the first thing you smell when you go into a chicken house? Ammonia. You're smelling that top note. It's like the Hanna Barbera, the Hanna Montana perfume. You're smelling that top note. It's very strong. You leave, come back an hour later, it's gone. Okay? You're going to smell more of a fishy planty, skunky smell. It's going to be the major smell you smell. Major smell you smell. Major odors you smell. Notes. You come back two days later, those base notes may still be there. You may have to stick your nose on the ground, but you're going to smell kind of a uh, earthy, scatty, garbagey type smell. It'll be very faint, but it'll still be there. So... I had a student once that uh, she graduated, oh, probably 10 years ago. I saw her. She came to one of our uh, uh, state meeting, state engineers meeting. She says, you know, I can never buy perfume anymore without thinking that stupid lecture you gave. Because I'm thinking, oh, chicken. Anywho. Uh, so we're, we're building our, our little matrix here. Concentration. Like I say, concentration is not, we don't perceive concentration but different concentrations of odorants can affect the way we smell something. Some things that are low concentration smell one way, and higher concentration smell another way. That's kind of a strange phenomenon that's hard to, hard to quantify. But there are two things. There's the detection level, and there's the recognition level. If I said that hydrogen sulfide was in this room to the detection level, what does that mean to you? You smell it, but it doesn't bother you. Okay, that's, that's what Leslie says. That's good. That's the exact definition I like. I, there's something in here, but I don't know what it is. But if it's hydrogen sulfide, I probably don't like it. Okay? If it's reached the recognition level, it's, by God, I don't like it, and it's hydrogen sulfide. I better get out of here because, you know, I'm smart enough to know that if I can smell hydrogen sulfide, it's probably going to kill me if I walk into a manure storage, for instance. Okay? So, going back to our visual, visualization scheme, what is this? It's a blue note. What kind of a blue note? Top note, because it's nice and, nice and thin. It's ammonia. It's our top note. It's our top blue note is ammonia. This is ammonia at the recognition level. Not only can you see it, but you recognize it as ammonia with a little problem from your, from your teacher. The recognition of ammonia is about 37,000 parts per billion. I say about. Josh Payne, who does our, our poultry training, will say, no, it's 20,000. Go down the hall, somebody else will say, oh, it's 15,000. 
This is not exact science. And you're going to learn in a little bit, little bit when you do the experiment is really not exact. But in a room this size, 37,000 parts per million is going to be about that much. If I was to shake this and then distribute it in the room, you would smell ammonia. You would smell something and you'd say, that's ammonia. And probably Leslie and, and Laura would be keeling over because it, it's pretty strong for them in the front. Okay. So if that's ammonia, what is this? How many can, how many can see something on the, the screen? It's a fly speck. It's blue, so it could be scat. It could be ammonia. It's at the detection level. This is actually supposed to be ammonia at the detection level. You smell something, but you're not sure what it is. You don't know if it's scat or if you know it's ammonia. You probably don't even know if it's skunk or ammonia, okay, because it's so low. In this room, that's going to be about like that, okay? It doesn't take much. Some of these very potentially dangerous compounds we can detect at very low levels, like hydrogen sulfide. When we're talking to poultry producers, the acute ammonia hazard is 50 to 100,000 parts per million. That means your eyes are going to water, you're going to feel burning in the lungs, you're probably going to want to get out of there. You know. yeah, your, your brain says, this ain't good, I'm getting out of there. So that's twice the recognition level, more or less. Two rings. The problem we have a lot of times is that the chronic exposure level of ammonia is below, it's above the detection limit, but below the recognition level. Okay? I tell poultry farm, I'm a, I am a middle-aged asthmatic. If I come to your poultry farm, First, I'm going to wear a dust mask, because if I don't wear a dust mask, I'm going to be hacking for the rest of the week. And I probably will avoid going in your house altogether, okay? Because I know it's going to bother me. It's, it's an irritant that, that's going to affect my asthma. Um, but the, what's dangerous to poultry farmers is they go into their house day after day. They don't smell it. They don't smell any ammonia. It's not hurting me. But it could be actually hurting them, even though it's below the, below the recognition level. But they smell something. Okay. Now, one of the great, life's great ironies, if you go to OSU, if you go to Oklahoma State University and you know the good football rivalries in the United States, our cross-the-state rival is OU, Oklahoma University. And it just so happens that OU is how we measure odor concentration in notes. So the freshmen, they pick up that right away. So OU is odor concentration. Okay. We generally use a method called olfactometry. Now, I'm not going to propose, I'm not going to say that I'm an expert in olfactometry. So, this is kind of an overview. And I, I meant to say at the first, I'm going to be here, my plane doesn't leave till Friday at 6 o'clock. So, if anybody has anything they want to add to this, particularly I have nothing on dust. I know dust is a great component of at least the movement of odor. So, if you have any great ideas, that you might want to incorporate into this, let me know. Okay. So olfactometry, and I think this quote goes all the way back to 2000, the first Bush-Gore election. Olfactometry is a lot like choosing presidents. What matters is the opinion and the majority. Okay. What we do with olfactometry, we actually use you as the detectors. We could go out there with major mass spec and grab the sample and, and find out what the concentration is. But what we actually do with olfactometry, we get a group of people and we present the odors to them and ask them what they think. Okay? And if half of them says it smells this way, that's the way it smells. So it's just like choosing your, your leader. Olfactometers come in a lot of different styles. It's the synchro, the ones that did the... Uh, the, a lot of the olfactometers in the United States are made by St. Crow. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. This lady has got some kind of thing on her head. They're probably measuring her brain waves in response to the odor. This one we're going to talk about a little bit, different, a little bit later. 
they give you seven different or seven or eight different options of, of smelling. So you're, you're trying to compare different smells, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Basically, all they are, if you take a, take away the the outsides and look at the guts, a nofactometer is nothing but an instrument that makes very precise dilutions of odorants with air that has gone through some kind of filtration so it doesn't have any odor. Okay, so it's just an instrument to presenting dilutions of odors through this panel or a panel. A lot of places, in fact, most places will have a panel. They'll go back to the same panel or same uh, population over and over again. Like when you're uh, you're in the jury pool, you may get called to the jury. You may get called to be on no odor panel. And they generally train them a little bit before they they join the panel. Okay. So this is a nice code cord of farmstead odors, right? Is this is what y'all would perceive? You go into a hog barn, you're going to be seen using the visualization scheme that we've been talking about. Yes or no? So it's a nice little cord. You imagine the, the the angels with a harp. Oh, come on, guys! No, it looks like this. This is actually, and I. Go back in the notes. I can't remember the paper this came from. There was actually a group of people, scientists, back in the 90s in Germany, that took a sample of the air under the slats of hog barn. And they analyzed it for every single odorant they could imagine, and this is what it came out with. This is basically as good a representation as I could do, taking the concentrations of say ammonia, and if the recognition level is 37,000 parts per billion. That's a heck of a lot more than 37,000 parts per billion, right? Okay. So if y'all smelled this, if they presented this to you, an olfactometer, which they're not going to, by the way, what would you think you would smell? How would you react to this? Ammonia. There's lots of ammonia there. Very recognizable. There's some skunk there, too, though. You can see that there's a kind of a nice background of green. There's a heck of a lot of green, a lot of brown, a lot of scat. Basically, you would smell this and you'd be so overwhelmed, you probably wouldn't be able to say what it was if you snuffed it right into your nose. Okay? You might be able to say, hey, that's a scum. I mean, that's a pig. That's definitely pig odor. So the olfactometer dilutes it up to get it to something you can perceive a little bit better. Okay? This is a 1 in 10 dilution of that pig odor, more or less. Doing the best I could with taking away shapes. What do you think this would smell like to you? Do what? It smell like pig. It definitely smell like pig manure. You, if you sniffed at it long enough, and you're one of these trained perfume people, you'd say, "Oh, I can smell the top notes of ammonia." You know, giving away to a gentle, planty odor and the, the persistence of scat or something. But probably you'd smell that and you'd say, "That's a very strong pig odor." Okay. So they're, they gave you a blank. They present you with a the smell. They give you a nice, relaxing blank. And they're going to give you another dilution. How about this one? What does this look like to y'all? What do you think you'd smell if you saw that? You probably still smell pig. Okay. You might say, hey, that's kind of piggy. The other point is you definitely would see something, right? But you might not be able to say what it is. So it's above the detection limit, but maybe we're getting off the recognition. So actually, odors and odor runs both have detection and, and uh, recognition levels. Um, so you get in the picture here. They dilute it out. They give you a blank. They're going to dilute it again, but they don't do it sequentially. They're going to do it randomly, so you're off your guard. You know, you have to say, can I smell it or not, right? They're not going to give it to you. say, oh, I don't think I can smell anymore. They're going to give you a 200, a 400, an 800. All right, another dilution. Show of hands, how many people can see something on the screen? Okay, so we got almost not only a majority, but it's unanimous. Y'all see something. At this point, it might smell like pig. Another blank. Show of hands, one in 1,000 dilution. Most of y'all probably three-fourths to eight-tenths. Blank, nothing there. Show of hands. Come on, there's some old folks in here. I know. I mean, I'm the old, probably the oldest guy in the room. 
blank. And I should give it to you really fast so you can't stare. Okay. How many people saw something? It's almost all of you. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, we're getting almost everybody. Okay, we're almost down to I'm st oh crap. I'm oh, sorry. Is that I wasn't gonna say the other word? Okay, sixteen thousand. Usually okay, you can see that there's some dots here. And there'll be some dots on the screen, you know, sometimes too. We're getting down in the range where it's kinda of hard to tell whether you can see something or not. Usually these eighteen, nineteen year olds, they can tell when they see something on the screen. Yeah, Leslie's like eighteen year old. No, she's like an eighteen year old. She can see but generally, I think most people would probably, about half of y'all would see the 16,000, half of you wouldn't. So the majority is still saying, I can see that. But then when you get down to 32,000 dilution, half of you wouldn't say anymore. So what we're saying now is we have diluted it to the threshold. Okay? And a lot of places that do this sort of thing, like University of Minnesota, that's basically how they report things. Dilution to threshold. And actually in all the modeling they do, they say five miles down the road, they can still perceive it at dilution to threshold. Okay? An OU is just the inverse of the dilution to threshold. So if we diluted that sample 16,000 times and y'all still could smell it, or 50% of you could still smell it, take the inverse of one over 16,000, the original sample had an OU of 16,000. So that particular pig odor, with my manipulation and, and working with y'all, doing a mock olfactometry, we said this original smell had an OU of 16,000. OUs and dilution to threshold are really good because you can put them right in dispersion models and you can, you can model the movement of odors across the landscape. And that's basically the limit to most of what we do that's as far as we take it, okay? Uh, this is some, they can use the same models we use for smokestacks, for instance. EPA will have, there's a model called Puffer that models the dispersion of smoke away from smokestacks or particulate models. Um, this is one that has, I think this is supposed to be a sewage treatment plant, or this is a sewage treatment plant, and they're modeling the plume of concentration going downstream from the sewage treatment plant and they can say that this house here smells it. This house here doesn't smell it. Okay? It's beyond the dilution of threshold. The problem is we don't really smell concentration. We smell intensity. All right? There's a difference. There's a difference between concentration and intensity. Okay? Two methods of measuring intensity are the referencing supra threshold method, which is the real scientific way of doing it. Well, they're both pretty scientific. Um, and the descriptive scale. The referencing supra threshold, what they do is they compare an odor that we don't know how strong it is to a concentration of butanol, of one butanol, that we do have a pretty good idea how most people are going to respond into that odor. So when you do the referencing threshold, you're actually comparing it to a a known concentration of butanol. And they use that instrument like the lady in Germany was doing. They'll give you a smell and they have eight dilutions of butanol. And so they ask you, which one of these does it smell most like? Okay. Oh, and that's a Dr. Lim now in Missouri. This is at Purdue. They actually use the same crow. I like to show that. I hope he's in the audience. You can see the bald spot on top. I got that off the web. They published it. Anyway, uh, you need about, uh, I think the, this is actually an ASTM and an ISO method. I can't give you the number. It's not on there. Um, you have to have at least eight sniffers. And this is showing the different sniffers at the, the, the different ports at which they smelled it. Okay? So this particular smeller said, I would rate it the same strength as a number six, which turns out to be a 388 part per million volume dilution of butanol. So what they do is they take that and then they'll go back, they do some math, they take the, the average and standard deviation, and then they 
do a log transformation, they say this odorant had a 2.02 .02 log smell of butanol to it. So it's very, it can be a very precise method. Another equally precise, if they do it right, way of measuring strength is you basically give a dilution to some a group and you say rate it. And the usual scale is a 0 to 6 or a 0 to 10. And there is a correlation between concentration and intensity. Lo and behold. This is uh, Misselbrooks. He's an Englishman, I guess back in probably in the early 90s they did this. He comes to some of these conferences every now and then. I didn't see him here today. Basically, they took some hog odor. I think what they did is they spread it on the ground. They had like a wind tunnel and they started circulating it. And the longer they circulated, they presented smells to people. And at 1 in 100 dilution, the average bunch of people would say, oh, it's between a 3 and a 4. It's distinct or strong. Okay? So basically, you give them a whole bunch of dilutions, and they say, on a scale of 0 to 6, this is strong or this is weak. Okay? And they can do very precise measurements that way. So... We can go back to our modeling with the concentration and say, oh, if it had, a dilute, if it had an odor concentration of 80 OUs, well, it must, they must smell it as being very distinct or distinct at that point, right? It's not so simple because every single odor has its own characteristics. Okay? They are usually a linear correlation on the log base 10 of the concentration, but there'll be different reactions. There'll be the, some odors are stronger than the other. They're not stronger. I mean, the concentration's the same, but you perceive it as a stronger odor. Does that make sense? For instance, if we had a 1 in 100 dilution and we had hog manure, which is the red, people would say, in this case, it was, again, somewhere between distinct and strong, but the green is poultry litter, the exact same concentration, they would say, oh, that's very strong or strong. Okay? This is probably where the poultry producers don't like it. Why is poultry litter smell? What you would think would be their way around. Why? Most people, most people don't like the smell. Well, that's a, pers that's a fairly cultural, culturally ingrained attitude doesn't sound right. Most people in the United States, Canada, Mexico would say pigs smell bad. You no, know, we're from chickens. Okay. But I just showed you that poultry litter is actually stronger smelling at the same concentration. Why is that? Even though they would probably still say pigs smell worse. Right. It's that ammonia coming back to get you. It's the Hannah Montana perfume of manures. Okay. Uh, if you came back a day later, it may not smell as strong. The, the pig manure, which has a lot of base notes in it, would smell stronger, probably. Yeah. So then we have a we go back to the character issue. That doesn't sound right. The, the, the character of a smell, and since most of the time in agriculture, we're, well, in litigation-type agriculture, we only care whether it smells good or bad. So the measure is offensiveness. How bad does this smell? Okay. And usually they're going to use uh, something similar to intensity. They will uh, present to this panel, you're usually comparing one to another. You want to know if this process made it smell worse or better, right? Smelled less offensive or had any effect at all. So you're going to give them samples at the same intensity, present it to the panel, and then they're going to rate it 0 to 6. Okay? Why do you have to dilute it to the same intensity? Wrong you are. According to science, or according to the people who do this, offensiveness is an intrinsic property of the odor. Okay? If a skunk smells bad, strong, it smells bad if it's weak. Y'all buy that. You buy that? Still going to smell bad. So you would rate a six to a strong smelling skunk and six to a weak smelling skunk. Uh, 
So what we're going to do, you can see there's a bunch of, there's four urine yellow bottles. It has, <laughs> I just had, uh, well, I, for, a couple of weeks ago for St. Patrick's Day, they're green. I usually make them red. I decided to make them yellow today. Uh, so, so Southwest, when they loaded my bags, they could have, you know, get a thrill of see these. What's this yellow bottle? Anyway, we got four yellow bottles there. Okay, what we're going to do, this is uh, Aiden Carmichael uh, back in 2011. She was a freshman taking the experimental course, and she and another student named Hannah Spittler did this experiment, which you're about to participate in. They diluted up uh, a known odor, and they presented it to the rest of their classmates. And they asked them to say how strong it smelled, and they also asked them how good it smelled, okay? The experimental hypothesis that they came up with, and y'all are going to also prove or disprove, is that an odor will be equally offensive no matter how strong it is. That's our working hypothesis for this experiment, okay? I already see people thinking, oh, that can't be true. We're going we're gonna to put it to the test. We're like Mythbusters. Mythbusters. Okay, so y'all are going to go one by one, and we have a pretty good group now, so this may take a while. You can go one by one, and y'all are going to sniff that. What you want to do is you uncap it. This is Monica Murray. She graduated in 2008 or so. You're going to uncap it. You can stick your nose right in there if you're brave enough. But I would probably do that number. It does, this one doesn't smell bad. Well, we'll see. I don't think it smells bad, but you're going to tell me your opinion. Okay, you're going to smell of it. And we usually have four cans, and you're going to vote. And there's a little ballot there. For each sample, it's going to say A, B, C, or D, not one, two, three, four. You're going to ask, you're going to answer to me, how strong does it smell, and how pleasant is it? Okay. You're going to use the same intensity scale that Misselbrooks used, zero to six. If it's a zero, what does that mean? I don't smell nothing. In fact, this is you shouldn't smell anything because it's distilled water, right? Shouldn't have a smell. The bottle is probably have a little smell. The zero, you don't smell nothing. Six, what does that mean? I cannot possibly think of anything that smells stronger than that. Not necessarily bad. It could still smell good. It could be the most intense banana smell I ever smell. Okay? And it, it would wake me up in the middle of the night. So the intensity scale is zero, no odor, six, extremely strong. I cannot imagine anything stronger, okay? And you're going to rate it all the way from faint, distinct, strong, very strong. Do it very quickly. Don't spend a lot of time snorting on it, okay? Do it quick. You're going to smell it, and then you're going to write down also your opinion of how pleasant it smells. And Hannah and uh, Aiden, they wanted to keep the same zero to six scale because we're going we're gonna to graph it. In the class, the students actually graphed it. Okay, so they want to have zero to six, but how do you show it pleasant versus unpleasant, right? So you're going to go all the way from minus three, which is very unpleasant. You cannot imagine anything smelling worse than this. You know, knock the buzzard off the gut wagon. You know, this is so bad. I can't imagine anything worse. If it's a three, you can't imagine anything better. You know, it's waking up the mom's cinnamon rolls or something. It's just so pleasant. Okay. We're going to do this. Okay, you're going to smell it. Write down your opinion. We only ha only have one ballot box, but you're all going to stuff the ballot box. And then, one by one, you're going to go out that door, and you can come back or you can skedaddle. Okay? So we're going to do it. It's going to take us a little while. So Leslie will start. She'll sniff it. She'll vote. And then the next person, Laura, will do it and then Jackie, and so forth. And it probably usually takes us, when I have a group of students of 15 or 16, it usually takes about half an hour. So it's y'all's choice. You can start doing it. You can go back in that door, and we can keep talking. Or you can come back, and once we're done doing this, it's going to take me about 15 minutes to tally the results. So in about 45 minutes, we're going to come back and look at this. So you got a choice. You can decide to do nothing. Or y'all can look at, at the anatomy podcast. Or what I usually do with the students is I have a banter with, I ask them what's the strongest thing you smelled, what's the worst thing, you know, and, and try to find the uh, sense of the group. 
So what's y'all's pleasure? We'll probably have to do more. We'll probably do all three before. <laughs> Don't take much time on it. And if you see her knees getting weak and whatnot, she's faking. You know, I, I guarantee you this does not smell bad. Um, the, we're going to show you an experiment in a little while. Where <laughs> you spit it on the floor? All right. All right. The, the experiment's busted. Everybody's going to smell number. They're going to smell number two, or let's say B. Uh, uh, the, the, the under experiment we're going to I'm going to demonstrate that we did that we give them a bunch of different smells, some of which are good and some of which are bad, and we have some really interesting results of that. Question. Ah. The, wait till after the experiment. It'll be it'll become a little more clear. I have them arranged in such a way that it's not perfect. In fact, we can go back. Uh, I, the data I have for this particular experiment is not going to show up very well, but we can go back and actually look at the responses, and you can see the first response is different than the second response, and also. There's a phenomenon called odor fatigue. The more you smell it, the less you smell it. So there's a lot. This is not, this is, this is smell. Well, smell science is actually pretty precise. This is not really precise. It's more of a demonstration. Um, but you'll be amazed. I think you'll be amazed. When we see the results, we have some pretty consistent results out of it. And Leslie's about to pass out. It's so horrible. No, because, um, well, I, I, yes and no. Okay. I can tell you what the research says. The research says that there's no difference. Um, and in fact, Carl Van Davender from Arkansas has done some, some kind of demonstration work where they have the nasal ranger. You ever seen that where they dilute it? It's kind of a handheld olfactometer. He's done some work with groups from Little Rock and groups from Fayetteville and groups from hog farms. And basically, I mean, it's borne out through the literature that, if anything, there's no difference between farm groups and non-farm groups. And if anything, the farm groups react stronger to the bad odors. And the, the perception is they know what a farm should smell like, and this ain't it. Okay, that's the mental process they think they're going through. So that's a common thing. Our students uh, were about... In the last 10 years, we average about 20, 30% female, 70, 80% male, probably 50, 50 farm versus, well, not farm, 50% urban Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Lawton, the more urban type areas, 50% uh, small town farm, or probably 10 to 20% hardcore farm kids. Uh, uh, it's pretty, I'm, I'm not going to say lily white. It's pretty much a white audience. We've got a lot of American Indians, though. Um, but it, it's fairly racially homogenic. Uh, they're all 18. Some of them are 26, 27 years old. Pretty much 18, 19 years old. So the result you're going to see is, is that sample. Um, well, that's a good question. You, you think a group from Norway, for instance, would react to the smell of fish compared to somebody from Botswana? I don't know. But there probably is a difference. There's a lot of cultural variability when it comes to odor. Any other questions before we move? I jump to the, the anatomy lesson. I'm, I'm, uh, my whole hypothesis is yes, there is, that I can demonstrate through visual and you can perceive it by odor. I mean, by, by looking at these, what's, whatever. I'm hoping that by going through dilution, you develop a sense of, of smell. Now, I've, I really need to do this, and I should have done it this time. We should do pre- and post-testing and see if we can get... I want to get with somebody over in our statistical services to do this a little bit more precise. But I'd like to find that out. I don't know. But my, my guess is, from the reactions I've had over the last 17 or so years, that, that people get it uh, after the first time they see it. But it's kind of anecdotal. I haven't quit doing it. I only had one group that I thought I was going to get run out of town. It was a group of poultry producers, and actually it was when I showed the OU. 
You know, the further you get from Stillwater, it, it's like a lot of states that there's, like in Arkansas, the, everybody's a Razorback fan. The Razorbacks are the professional team of Arkansas, right? OU is not only, I mean, they are professional. <laughs> At least they used to be back in the 80s. So anyway, you, you get away from Stillwater, the, the, most of the people are, are OU fans. So I'm over in northeast Oklahoma, and I show up OU, and I'm making these wisecracks, and I'm noticing a couple of guys in the back of the hat with OU, you know, back of the room with OU hats. They didn't like that too well. So that's the only time I, I really had trouble with it. Uh, when I was working with the uh, pork producers, I worked with a group of mash-off contract growers, and that was the best response I ever had. I had people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, it all makes sense now. You know, and I had, I worked with some car grill growers. Uh, they were polite about it, but I don't think it went over quite as well. So it all depends. And I have good days and bad days, just like everybody else. I have good audiences. And, you know, the poultry producers, they have to be there. They're required by law, so their attitude is probably pretty poor to begin with. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's pretty, that's, yeah, I can't imagine real estate agencies, agents going through with that, but yeah, that would be a good, you know, uh, another thing about the way we do it, these experience, experiments is they're very, there is nothing, next year I'm going to try to do the butanol dilution, I haven't done that yet, but apart from some glassware, this is nothing that you couldn't do yourself, pick your order and go with it. Um, I said when I when I um, did the abstract for this that we were going to have handouts with all the labs. Uh, I didn't get around doing it, but I'm going to put it up on the web uh, as I get them. It's kind of complicated to get to this point in this particular experiment, and there's a little sheet that tells you how to get there. This is pretty complicated setup. The other one where you're comparing different smells, you just go out and get one. You just get that versus that, and you can do with it what you will. Any other questions? But it'd be neat, you know, to have a scratch and stiff one. But that, you know, that requires a lot of technology. Uh, anybody old enough? To... Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I my first thought when I when I said I was going to do this back last September. Or so my thought is I was going to have a family trip up here, and I was going to bring all the glassware, you know, the uh, volumetric flask and the beaker, and I was going to do all the mixing. And, and then when uh, decided I'll just come by myself. I was thinking, how am I going to get all this from? So actually, the, what you're going to smell today, I actually mixed up last Friday. And I did some testing before I came here. And it seems like the responses aren't that different. You can probably go about a week. Depends on how many people have opened them and manipulated them. But they'll last quite a while, at least this particular smell. I did fly. Put on check baggage. I didn't carry it on. Yeah, no glass. Yeah. Any other questions about how this would work or would not work? Yeah, we're about halfway through. Crickets are going to start chirping pretty soon. Why don't we, for lack of me standing up here not knowing what to do, it won't take long. This is the first uh, thing, and it, like I said, I use this when I talk to like college students. But I have not done this for producers, and I probably won't for the foreseeable future. But, oh, come on. Manual, manual dexterity is, you, should, you, know, you shouldn't get a PhD if you can. Anyway, talking about this is the, this is the first one. So when I, when I talk to the, the college students, I start out with this. And then I build from talking about all the, you're going to see slices of human heads and that kind of stuff. When I, I build from that, and then I start talking about the, the perception from there. Um, basically, we have five senses. Sometimes they're called special senses. And they're broken down into physical and chemical. And our physical senses, touch, sight, hearing, all, they're easy to relate to. Because it's something you can touch and see, right? 
You know, it's, it's either electronic or electromagnetic waves, but it's all a phenomena, pressure wave touching something cold, hot. Uh, smell and taste are chemical senses. We actually have chemical sensors in our heads that, that lead to our perception of, of smell and taste. And this is where the problem comes. You get into organic chemistry pretty quick if you're going to try to talk about this. Now, animals, or at least a lot of animals, have three different methods of smelling. The first one is the uh, vomeral nasal organ. What's the vomeral nasal organ? Not all animals have one. We don't have one, for instance. Horses, rats, hamsters, dogs, think cats, snakes. What's vomeral nasal? What does it do? I saw Rob came up with an idea. Yeah. Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's the pheromone receptor. Okay. What's a pheromone? When I talk to the freshmen, they usually get pretty excited about this. What's a pheromone? And that's not a hormone. It's a certain type of odorant that's used by some animals with a vomeral nasal organ that that uh, it relates some kind of a communication, okay? And a lot of things in nature, humans not accepted, a lot of nature deals with sexual reproduction. So we, we, they, they, we get hung up on the fact that pheromones give a sexual response, but they do a lot of other things. So back in the 70s and 80s, if you were alive back then, or act, uh, I was about to say, oh, that's, I don't want to go there. They used to sell pheromone perfume, you remember that? supposed to drive the guys or the women crazy because there is a lot of research that showed that there might be human pheromones and there may be human pheromones, but we don't have a vermeral nasal organ. And by the way, it never worked for me, so it must not, you know, it must be hokey. Uh, so humans do not have the vermeral nasal organ, but they have the olfactory organ, and we also sense through a thing called the trigeminal nerve. If you slice the head in half, uh, our olfactory organ sits kind of up on top and toward the back of the, I guess that's your sinus, or the, the cavity behind your nose. When you smell, or when you take a normal breath, the air is going to come up, hit that or the, the, or the olfactory organ, and then go back down into the lungs. So when you sniff, when a dog sniffs, it's like really pushing up in there. So when you sniff at something, you're going to smell it stronger because you're getting more odorants to pass over your... It, it's simple physics, so to speak. It's also the back of your, your uh, nasal cavity is connected to your mouth, so when you eat something and you breathe out, you're going to smell what you just ate. Okay? Does that make sense? When you breathe in, it's called a scent. Some people say it's called a scent. When you breathe out, it's called aroma, okay? So when somebody says it has a nice aroma, that means they're breathing it through their mouth, right? Actually, a lot of our sense of taste is actually our sense of smell. If I was to give you cinnamon and wouldn't let you, and close your nose off, you wouldn't basically would not taste anything. But it's the odorants and cinnamon that give it its smell, okay? So the, the, the aroma of, of foods and whatnot is very important uh, in our way we perceive smell. Okay, the olfactory bulb, what happens is the, the odorants go, first they dissolve into the mucosa, otherwise known as snot. Okay, these, these odorants have to dissolve into that, and then they do this really complicated number here. Um, there's actually a protein that binds to the odorants, and you sense the, the then there's going to be like an electrical response goes up through the nerves, okay? This is what causes this thing called odor fatigue. You can be over, you can overwhelm all those little proteins so they can't smell nothing anymore. Okay. Uh, how many of y'all are in a room they just re reinnovated? All right. When y'all walked in, what was the first thing you smelled? New carpet, paint. 
All right, you go in there now, do you smell it? It's still there because I got a headache when I woke up this morning. So, which is actually kind of disconcerting, you know. I don't smell it anymore, but, you know, I, I know it's not formaldehyde because that's illegal, but there may be something there. So the more we smell something, you go into a florist, you're going to smell roses, right? And then you're going to be overwhelmed with the roses. You won't be able to... It, then, you, Which is really good because it would be bad for us, particularly when we're in the wild, if we smell nothing but scat, for instance, and there was a bear behind us, and we were so overwhelmed with this smell that we couldn't smell the other smell. So it's actually a, it's a good thing. Um, a lot of hog farmers, for instance, uh, Kim Brock, who runs our hog farm, he'll say, I haven't smelled hogs for 20 years. I don't know what these people are talking about. He can't. He doesn't smell anymore. It, his, uh, yeah. He can say, it's that darn dairy down the road that's smelling. It's the horse farm. It's, it's that horse urine. It's not my hog farm. Yeah. So you can, you can permanently damage your, your nasal or your, your ability to I was I when I was in college I had a friend in the dorm who lived near a cement plant and they actually ruined his sense of smell. But this is different than that. This this is not physical damage, it's temporary. I don't know, but I think it's the protein language. It's also the ability to dissolve into the mucus. So there's a whole bunch of factors that work together. And I, and I think you're right, too, There's a, you burn out your, your electrical linkages, too. So, yeah, it's pretty complicated. So anyway, you go up, uh, you have these cilii, which sense, and you have a bunch of nerve endings. goes up through the, uh, the um, bulb into this olfactory gland, I think. It's, it's actually called the olfactory gland. It's actually sitting right on the bottom of your brain. Your nose is actually connected to your brain. So you hear somebody, sometimes people say, your sense of smell is hardwired to your brain. That's what they're talking about. It's actually right, I mean, it's, you could say it's part of your brain. Okay, the olfactory bulb. And we process smells through the, I always want to say the limbic. You know, like there was a lady from Spain. Uh, limbic system, which is kind of the reptile brain, right? It's, it's our reacting, sensing brain. It's not our thinking brain. Uh, like I was telling Jackie, we have chickens. My wife is always worried about how our chickens feel. You know, and I say, they're, they're, they're a hypothalamus with feathers, you know. They're, they just barely have a reptile brain. They don't think, they don't feel. But they probably do have some rudimentary feelings. Uh, but anyway, it's, what's interesting about, because we process odors in the limbic system, it, the limbic system also is the that we use. We take in like visuals and smells and whatnot, and it's what processes our memory. It sticks it up into the memory slots. So the sense of smell is really connected to memory, and it actually has a name. Again, I don't speak French, so it's the Proust or the Proust effect, named for Marcel Proust, the uh, French author. He wrote a book called... Times, uh, memories of times forgotten or memories of times past. And a lot of, this, lot of the story involved, I smelled this, I have a memory of, of the past. Okay, so that's how I got the name, the Proust effect. So, for instance, um, you all know Pavlov's dog. You know, you, he heard the ringing of the bell, they salivate when they got the food. Well, that's Pavlov's dog, because whenever I smell a lagoon, I get hungry. When I was in grad school at Iowa State, uh, I worked at the digester up on northwest of town, the old the beef nutrition farm. We had a digester up there, so I ride my bicycle up there. Like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I take my samples, I go home, and I eat dinner. So I got to identify the smell of anaerobic digestion, or lagoon, with eating. So I smell lagoon, I get hungry. To this day, 30 years later, I still get hungry. Okay. The other, is everybody gone yet? Oh, Larry. So we're, we're almost, no, nah, well, y'all sort it out. Don't fight. Y'all are going to get a chance. The longer it takes y'all to do it, the longer I talk. So. Uh, the other method that we, the other system we use to sense odorants is the trigeminal nerve, which is all, it's a, kind of in the back of our brain. It's called trigeminal because there's Gemini, there's two of them. So it's like Gemini. 
to the, the twins. It's twinned. And there's three of them. They're, they're tri-Gemini. Okay, there's three twins. There's the ophthalmic nerve, the maxillary nerve, and the mandibular. When you go to the dentist, they're deadening your maxillary and your mandibular nerves that go through the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve basically senses pain, heat, pain uh, responses. Okay, But there are some parts of the maxillary root that, no, the, yeah, the maxillary root that actually have connectors into our olfactory bulb. So we actually can sense a lot of odorants and a lot of odors through the trigeminal nerve. Notable about it is one of them that we do is menthol. What is menthol? What does menthol smell like? I was to come on. It smells like mint. Is what gives mint the smell of mint and the taste of mint. The aroma of menthol gives you the taste of mint. At small doses, it gives you kind of a cool feeling. You eat that, you take that wintergreen lifesaver and you suck in and you actually feel cool. That is actually your trigeminal nerve telling you this is cool. I'm, I'm sensing menthol. It gives you, if you were to take a lot of it in, peppermint, you would feel pain. In fact, uh, isn't there some, I guess it's the clove stuff that they, you can dead, try to deaden your nerves with. So that's basically using the same sort of thing. Another one we smell is capsaicin. What is capsaicin? Capsaicin? That's pepper. That's what Mexican food tastes, makes it taste like. The aroma of capsaicin gives Mexican food its flavor. And the more you have, the more you heats. And the more you got, it's pepper spray, right? So... Capsaicin is another one at small doses can smell like tortillas or not tortillas. Well, can smell like tacos. Strong doses can make make you feel pain. Acetic acid, vinegar. Uh, we got enough time. I usually I have these endless stories that the students never get fond of. I mean, uh, I said that wrong. Okay. When I was in high school, I had this job in a hospital, and we had this glacial acetic acid, which is 90% acetic acid. So I kind of was curious. I wondered what 90% acid vinegar smelled like. I opened the bottle. It knocked me on my backside. I, I turned. It blacked out. I found myself on the floor. That was my trigeminal nerve says, don't do that again. You know, It's uh, basically it, very small doses. It's okay. At stronger doses, you're going to feel pain. Ammonia, the old smelling salts, the boxer gets knocked out. And you break the smelling salts. Trigeminal nerve says, get up. You know, you feel pain. You can't help but respond. I think everybody's gone through it now, haven't they? In my left and, oh my God, I timed it just right. So y'all take about a 15-minute break. Uh, this is the one time I get to feel like Jeff Probst. I'm going to go tally the votes. Y'all don't watch Survivor, I'll take it. I'm going to go tally the votes and come back and we'll see how we did and compare it to some earlier trials. Am I right or was I wrong when I said that you basically y'all measure the dilution to threshold and that's your your basis for all your, your work? So, yeah. Um, now, the other thing that uh, somebody asked earlier, and I kind of almost gave it away, but what I've done is I took, I took uh, 10 milliliters, actually 11 drops of this stuff. I diluted it in 100, no. 500 milliliters of distilled water, so it's a 1 in 100 dilution. It was the strongest one, which hopefully y'all thought was the last one. Okay, so that's one in, one in 100. Then I took 200. I took 125 milliliters, diluted that up to 500. So it's a it's a geometric progression of fours. So the the strongest is four times stronger than the next one. Um, and then you can see up here, there's the dilution rate. Um, I'm going to show you in a little bit kind of the skew and, and that sort of stuff with the other data that we've collected. And uh, you'll see some of the outliers that Larry would have thrown out. You may see, well, actually you won't see them here. There is one that I would definitely throw out that I saw in here. I'm, I'm not going to name names, but it was kind of toward the end, Larry. The... Well, darn it. Here we go. So this is, if you took the... 
Uh, 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 uh. Oh, that's not bad. If you take the dilution on the x-axis and the intensity on the y-axis and you plotted it, we found out exactly what we thought we were going to find out, right? That there is a correlation, there's a, there is a positive relationship between concentration and odor intensity, and it is logarithmic. So we've, once again, science has proven correct, okay? Uh, you've, the, the equation doesn't mean much, but most of y'all said that the weakest one, which was 1 in 6,400, was uh, 2, which was kind of, I think that was faint. Where did my ballot box go to? Y'all said it was, uh, the, the odors were between faint and somewhere between distinct and strong. Okay, but this is the plus and minus one standard deviation. So you can see there is a lot of opinion. You know, one person, there was one that said it was a five negative one on the Lequist dilution. Was that you, Larry? We used Gruner. Uh, I'm not casting any, I mean, this is not, it's opinion, it's, it's not, it, it really smelled five and the minus one. For that one. So anyway, uh, the correlation coefficient, the R squared is 0 0.8 or so. I've seen a lot of research done on lower correlations than that. Okay, but what was our hypothesis? When we started this, we said we had a hypothesis. What was that hypothesis? And I hadn't even looked to see if... So there should be no correlation between dilution rate and offensive or uh, pleasantness, right? Well, here's the... Un oh, crap. Here's... I wasn't going to say that word, but I've said... You yeah, have plenty of time. Okay. Oh, come on. And I should stick with PowerPoint. You know, I could have pasted these into slides or something. Okay, here is dilution rate versus pleasantness. And... Huh? It doesn't, you know, to me... I'm going to see that, and I'm going to look at those standard deviations, and I'm going to say that's a flat line. There's no difference between one and the other. But if you looked at the averages, again, I've seen research. <laughs> They've said that's a positive correlation, an R square of 0.6 or so. So what do you all think? Is it busted, or is it that pretty good? Eh. This is what the college students, 18, I think most of them were, we may have had a couple of 30 year olds in there. Uh, most of them are 18, 19, two weeks ago, the exact same thing. I mean, it's amazing. Every time I do this, I think it's not going to work. And every time it comes out, that was their correlation between dilution and intensity. They had an R square of 0 0.92. Pretty darn good. Uh, and that was with... Uh, Go up now, crud farkle. Oh, that's a good word. Now we'll use that one from now on. I think somebody said that on Andy Griffith. Oh, no. darn crud farkle. Uh, I think that there was, uh, I'm going to tell you how many, how many noses sampled that. That had an N of 11. So actually that would be, you really should do this with 30 or more. And y'all did it with 14, but you ended up with, it, was, it wasn't bad, what we ended up with. And then their correlation between <clears throat> pleasantness and dilution rate, I would say that they showed a relationship. So on Mythbusters, it would be busted. You know? And that one, the hypothesis probably wouldn't hold. I would say a reasonable scientific doubt that it didn't, didn't work. When Hannah and Aiden did it, Two years ago, the exact same thing, pretty much the same range. We used the same dilutions, same perfume, or cheap cologne. Uh, when they did the, when they looked at a, the pleasantness versus dilution, it looked an awful lot like yours. Again, R squared is 0.4. So y'all are feeling pretty good. 
about y'all's hypothesis that, yeah, you know, you can't help it. It smells stronger. You're going to say one thing or the other. Let's look at what the students did two weeks ago. I actually made them smell swine manure. And the exact same dilutions, they did the 1 100 down to 1 6,400 dilutions. Come on. Grab that son of a buck. Oh, did I do it? Yeah. <laughs> Just by accident, I moved over there. This is their correlation between intensity of swine manure and dilution from 1 to 100 to 1 to 6,400. It's almost exactly the same as the perfume, the same dilution. It's a little bit higher. They, they reacted a little bit stronger at the higher dilution rates. It has a wonderful correlation coefficient. 0 0.97. I don't, I've never done an experiment with anything in nature that would have that kind of a... I mean, even bending of steel beams isn't that good. So that's a pretty good... Even as crude as this was, we ended up with some pretty darn good... Now, this is the disappointing part. Well, I don't know if it's disappointing. It's the truth. This is their correlation between dilution and offensiveness for swine manure. Is there a correlation there? There's a darn strong correlation there. So I would say myth busted on that one. I think, and it's the, the fact that it was a negative smell versus a positive smell that I make a difference. We're going to have to look at this again. And I probably, if you went through the scientific literature, you would see that there, there are some. I don't know. So that's why you really have to, if you're going to do the offensiveness or the pleasantness or the hedonic tone or one of the the character scale is you better dilute your samples to the same intensity or you're going to bias your results. Okay. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly. Anybody that's really worried about getting dinner can, can split. But we're going to, I'm going to show you the results of the experiment we have done a lot of. You show. Okay. This is the other laboratory experiment. Experience exercise, and what we've done is we've we've given what I like to call the mystery liquids. They don't know what it is. They're usually dyed. Some of them are colored. Hint, hint. We we give them swine manure, so we have to all color them dark, the same purple or whatever. Uh, and then they just given the sample. This is the intensity. This is the offensiveness. There's there's no dilution about it. They just sniff and tell us what they think. We've looked over the, the last 15 or so years, I've had folks smell tap water. And actually, they do have a response to tap water. Uh, cologne, you know, y'all just experienced cologne. Raw swine wastewater, facultative lagoon wastewater, they smell a lot of stuff. And there's Monica again. They do the sniff test pretty much the same way. We have a ballot, 0 to 6. Uh, the intensity scale, the exact same one y'all used. They use the intent, the offensive scale that Misselbrooks used. In other words, if it's a six, you know, knock the buzzard off the gut wagon. Can't imagine anything worse. What I really like about this experiment is you can use it to do a lot of stuff. Uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Kaiser and Dr. Kumar, who've done this class, they've chosen to, to use this same experiment to show a lot of experimental error and that sort of stuff or variability and whatnot. This is one class of about 30 students. This is the response, the histogram of their response to the uh, intensity on the left and offensiveness on the right. And you, you see the, the skewer I see all the time. And I'm sure there is a, if you're a statistician, you'll tell me what kind of distribution that is. I call it the bison hump distribution. There seems to be a big, there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a gathering of opinion toward one end and it falls off and then there, the, the sense kind of trails off the other end. It's like the bison hump. And then, because this is offensiveness, and since most people would think it's pleasant, the zero is there's a skew toward the, the left and you could do some mathematical transi transitions to make it a normal distribution. So I guess what I'm saying is it's not a very normal distribution. And maybe with the uh, panels, you would throw out some of those. This is the results from seven years, and I think there's 233 noses. Smell that? 
and it's almost the same distribution as the, as the 30. So, again, every year I do this. I mix up the slime manure, and I've been out to the farm. I've mixed up in the lab, and I've got odor fatigue, and I'm trying to smell this. Other. It's not going to work this year. They're not going to smell that. They give me five every time. Oh, slime manure, they give me five every time. Even I think they're not going to smell this. So it's the same kind of bison hump distribution, and you got it for both of the, the responses. The other thing we do in this particular exercise is we, we take the average of the intensity and the offensiveness, and then we plot the standard deviation so it's a nice star. And here in the Cologne, the average intensity was 3.5. This is that one class and one. And, of course, standard deviation goes below zero, but, hey, that's math. This is the results of seven different years of doing it all. It's just like a, a good shot, shot a, a, a good marksman hits, hits that same spot. You know, and I'm just randomly doing the cologne. So there's a lot of error in here. Okay. One thing that we've done, and I don't want you to put too much store in this, and you're going to see in a second why maybe you might want to put too much store. It's very, um, when I show, when, if I show this to the Department of Animal Science, he gets real excited, Okay. What we did, we had our hog farm. We've taken smells at different points in our hog farm. They like to tell me, we spent a million dollars on that waste management system. Well, I'm going to show you how it works. Okay? This is the actual uh, waste management, hand the manure handling system. We actually have, we have these modular home for hogs. So we have like, they're double L up in, or triple L. We, we have 57 pits, and they all drain to a central sewer they go to a splitter box, it gets a choice to go into our digester, the ASBR, or it goes to a covered anaerobic lagoon, flows into an open aerobic lagoon or facultative lagoon, we recirculate, we do some subsoil irrigation. The first sample is the raw manure. Manure. This is from, I skipped one year in there. Actually, no, there's one extra year in there. This is the, the distribution of 233 people smelling raw manure. It's always up there in that upper right hand corner. Intensity of four to five. Pretty darn offensive. Not almost knocked the guzzard, buzzard off the gut wagon offensive. The other thing I like to do is say this is the kind of the cloud of possibility. Actually it's the sixty percentile possibility, right? Okay, since that's one standard deviation. The next thing they smelled Back when I was brave enough, I'd walk out on our cover, and we have some sample ports. I would dip the stuff, dip the effluent off the top, and I would, they would smell that straight. And you can see that there, there's no overlap. In other words, because we went through that anaerobic treatment, it's less intense and it's less offensive. Okay, you all buy that? You, you think, okay, let's, let's start laying applying covered lagoon effluent. It's going to reduce the intensity by one, you know, one log unit. What about the offensiveness? What did you just learn? That's probably wrong. If we diluted them to the same intensity, and I, I did some bubble diagrams if we really had a long time. You can see that a lot of people, when they do this thing, they say 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5. It kind of goes off in the, the northeast quadrant. So if we diluted these both to four, they would probably come closer together. You'd see a little overlap. But there would be definite, you know, you would say that there is definite treatment effect. Take it from our aerobic lagoon, and the aerators are basically for show. We've turned them on twice. But it does get good algal-type aerobic treatment. This is our results. We're definitely showing, at least by doing this little sniff test, that we've got good results. So we're all proud our $1.5 million has been to good use. Back in the old days, we had the smelliest hog farm in the state of Oklahoma. We actually did. It was one of these smelliest because we had pastured hogs right next to the highway. We had some old buildings. You, they, they couldn't even clean them. They were, they were nasty. But we had the best lagoon I have ever seen. We had this nice purple sulfur bacteria in there. This is their response. They actually thought the, an, the anaerobic or facultative lagoon with the sulfur purple bacteria smelled better or... They couldn't tell any difference. So all of that one and a half million dollars, we were doing just as good with the, the fact they were good. So you can do a lot of things with some real simple tests. So I guess what we hope we learned today was 
you can visualize odors. They have a structure, the odorants, the, the notes, the odorants, the, the odors. That we can measure them using those four parameters, and they're measurable. And then we can, there's all kinds of nifty things with costs absolutely nothing to do to, uh, to show these phenomena. And at that, I've gone five or six minutes over. Any questions? I heard a lot of good conversations when, when I was tallying the votes about some people thought horses really smelled bad. <laughs> that was good. In in uh, if you've never worked with horses and cleaned out stalls and smelled horse urine, you don't know what you're talking about if you say horses smell good, right? That's some of the stick. So anyway, there's a lot of opinions, um, but I hope this is one way we can try to to talk to diverse groups. I have never. I, the one group I have never presented this to is an, ad, uh, uh, an adverse audience. I've never given it. We used to, in Arkansas, we used to call them the againers. You know what that means? You're again, you're against something. Anything new, I'm against it. You know, so so I've never presented to somebody who is anti-hogs or anti-cattle or anti. And uh, one of the problems we have, in, and Larry, you can bear this out maybe, is no matter how well you treat it, and you say the offensiveness went from five to four or to one, if they smell anything, it still reminds them, I hate that damn hell farm. So, uh, I think that's one of the things, the messages we need to give the, the farmers is, yeah, we can spend a lot of money and make your, you know, get it down from a four to a five, but, or from a four to a one, but, but you, there's other, there's other cultural phenomenon involved. Anyway, I've talked way too long. Any other questions or time to look at some posters? All right.